do that quickly because you know you want to start working on you know well hopefully you've started working but you want to continue to work on the final product and not be bogged down with the design um, here's how the rest of the course is going to go this is lecture two of week 13 all right so this is class two of week 13 we have 15 weeks and then we have finals week and then finals week the class doesn't meet um, you can make appointments to see me if you need to and your project is due sometime during finals week I don't remember the exact date but it is on canvas um, today we will talk about tables all right what tables are um, how to use them how not to use them all right and how not to use them might not sound well I don't want to steal my own thunder we'll talk about how not to use them it's funny you know we we didn't talk about how not to use links right why do we have to talk about why not to use tables but we do trust me so we'll talk about tables today there probably will be something to finish up on tables on Tuesday of next week because um, we, we probably can get over most of it but probably not all of it today um, and then uh, we will talk about JavaScript and we will talk about JavaScript just enough to give you a taste for uh, it and a taste for what the capabilities of it are and by no means are we going to cover it as thoroughly well we couldn't in a week and a half cover it as thoroughly as we could cover um, HTML and CSS, which we spent roughly half the semester on, on each, right? I mean, if you were to boil it down, we probably spent half the time talking about HTML, half the time talking about CSS. So there's no way in a week and a half we can cover JavaScript that thoroughly. But could, we can at least show you how it fits into the picture and hopefully pique your interest to learn more about it. If you are interested in learning more about it, we cover it in more detail in CISS 232, which is client server scripting. See, these classes are almost like movies, right? You, you gotta, you know, every, every action movie has to set up the sequel, right? So, you know, at the end of Spider-Man 26, they have to plant the seed in your head for what Spider-Man 27 is gonna be or something like that. So I try to do the same thing. So after this class, one of the ways you can go, there's actually a couple different ways you can go after this class. Uh, CISS 232, CISS 243, and CISS 268, which is mobile web development. So all three of those are sort of more advanced versions of this class. The one thing I'd also like to talk about, if we have time, is about when you finish creating your web page and you want to publish it to the web, what you need to do. All right, so I'll make a point to talk about that briefly. And please, if I do forget, um, you know, remind me. So right after tables, we'll talk about that, and then we'll get into JavaScript. So that's how the course is going to go. Um, depending on timing, we may have time to spend the whole class session in lab working on your projects. I would like you to view other people's projects. So if you are in lab, show what you've done to other people and go and ask other people what they've done on their project. It's a good way to learn. It's a good way to get feedback on what you've done. Sometimes what you do seems perfectly clear to you because you're the one that made it. So of course you understand what the links mean. But when someone else views it, they're able to point out that it might not be as clear as you thought it was. So it's good to get another person's viewpoint and perspective on it. All righty tables first a history lesson all right little mini history lesson in the old days before there was CSS this is the old old days when the web was first invented and people first started using HTML most of the web pages looked like the web pages we did the first couple weeks of class there was very minimal formatting on them they were simply things that went in the flow you had a section for navigation and you had a section for content and maybe you had a header and a footer and stuff like that. But there was very little formatting. It just looked like a giant text do document with some formatting. All right. Um, let's see if I can find a really old web page. You should recognize this. 
this sort of page. This is the world's first web page. It's amazing to look at that and compare that to where we're at these days. I wonder when this was created. It was not that long ago, like in terms of Like 1989, they started doing things with it. Yeah, 1989. The first version of it was lost, but so that's apparently a recreation of it. Um, the earliest version goes back to 1992. So the web is a little older than my oldest kid. All right to put it in perspective, all right? But anyhow, you can see how those web pages look. And again, actually, this is how you accessed it back then, or this is one way that you could access it back then. And instead of using the mouse to click, you would use keys, so you could type in 10 and then go to section 10 and so on. All right. Obviously web pages are more involved than that these days. Because at some point web pages stopped being used for strictly scientific purposes and started being used for marketing purposes and business purposes. Well, as you know, scientists don't really care a lot the stereotype of a scientist is that they don't really care about the appearance of things, right? Uh, if you close your eyes and picture a scientist, the person you probably picture is Albert Einstein with his hair sticking way out, riding a bicycle, you know, and, and all that. So they're not concerned with the frills of things. But marketing people are very concerned with the, with the, uh, with the look of uh, and appearance of things, you know. And therefore, marketing people wanted more control over where, the way sites would look like, all right, and the appearance of it. And they wanted to format things, and they wanted to format things to look like their old brochures, right? Brochures are not simply pages full of text with maybe some headlines in. Brochures have fancy graphics on them and laid out and columns and things like that. Different size fonts, different fonts and all that. Now this was before CSS was created or had evolved sufficiently. So people wanted to go, marketing people wanted to develop websites that weren't simply straightforward like this, text, 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 but look more like modern websites where maybe you had the company logo and maybe you had a heading and maybe you had a navigation and then maybe you had the content. All right? But there was no CSS to do that. So what web developers did is they did they took a tag that was intended for one thing and used it for something else. Well, that's bad. That should, you don't lie to your browser. You don't use one tag when you really want to do, you do something else. All right? So what they did is they used a table tag to do that. Table tags allowed early web developers to develop with better layouts than you had without using tables. So it was a necessary evil. 
However, as CSS has developed and as browsers support CSS better, you should not use tables to achieve the layout of a page. Now, fortunately for us, we've never learned that. All right, we've used CSS from the start to control the appearance and the layout of the page. But if you look at old websites or you look at old examples online or you talk to a web developer that maybe learned web development years ago and hasn't updated their skills, they may still use tables for layout. And that's a no-no. Don't use tables for layout. All right? The reason for that is tables unnecessarily restrict you. What is a table? Well, a table is like an Excel worksheet, right? Where you have rows and columns of data. Something like that, a grid. So what is something that maybe we could use a table for? Well, if we were doing average temperature, average high temperature, we could have cities and we could have the months of the year, January, February, March, and so on. And then we could have cities, Cleveland, Honolulu, um, Rio, Paris. And then we could show the average temperature. So the average temperature in January for Cleveland might be 15 degrees, Honolulu maybe 75, Rio 86. Paris, 43. I don't know, I'm just making that up. And so on. That's a table of data. All right? And that's a proper use of a table. Proper use of a table is to show a table of data. And by table of data, I mean something that looks like an Excel worksheet, where there are rows and columns of data. And again, what tricky web developers did is they said, well, I can take this table, and I can make this cell really tall and wide. I can make the first cell really tall and wide, and the second cell wide, and the third or the, the, the second row each cell wide. And I can make a table that will be a grid that I can display the content of my page. That is a no-no. So tables are for tables of data, not for laying out the, uh, web pages. Now, here's the good news. If you didn't understand any of that, don't worry about it, all right? Because if you've been doing CSS layout the whole time and you have never used a table to achieve layout, then you have nothing to unlearn. But if you did web development years ago or if you see old examples and you see people using a table for layout, don't do it. That really locks down and makes your page far less flexible if you want to go, for example, and display it on a mobile device. All right? Or if you want to change the layout for the desktop version and instead of having side by side, you want things stacked on top of each other. CSS layout gives you flexibility. In fact, remember the website we visited at the beginning of class? Not the beginning, but somewhere when we started talking about CSS. CSS Zen Garden this site would not be possible if the table based layout was used. The flexibility that you get here to be able to lay out the content any way you want to comes from using CSS layout. And that's why CSS Zen Garden was created, to demonstrate that. So we're going to talk about how to create tables of data in HTML. Now, let's go in and let's take a naive approach and let's try to make a table of data. And sometimes this happens to students like early in the class because they might want to display table, data in rows and columns. And they find out that with the tags that we've talked about so far, 
it's not really possible. So, you might think, at least maybe early in the class, you might think that you could do something like this. City. January. February. March. Fifteen degrees, let's say February twenty two, March thirty two. I guess if I was really doing this, it could go in any direction, right? January could be sixty, and February could be twenty below, and March could be eighty five, and April could be thirty below, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, body tag and clothes off. Ah, thank you. So I'm going to go in, I'm just going to put a couple uh, cities in here. So And I'll put one more in here. Now, I might think that that would give me a table of data with rows and columns, right? But we know that it's not going to. What is it going to give us? I viewed this web page, what is it going to look like? Go ahead. Going to be on the same line. Everything's going to be on the same line. Why? Because the way that HTML browsers handle white space, right? The spaces between here and here are white space, right? And what does a browser do with white space? It collapses it down to a single space. So there's going to be a single space between city and January, a single space between January and February, a single space between February and March. And what's more, that's not going to be on a new line. That's going to be um, right next to March with just a space in between it and so on. So we're just going to get one line of data that will wrap around at the end of the browser window but essentially, it's not going to be a table at all. It's just going to be a string of data. And we've learned that that's actually a good thing, the way that the browser handles white space, because that allows us to format our code in a way that makes our code readable. All right? So sure enough, let me go and save this. Save it on the desktop. And I'll call it table.html. And if I look at it, as predicted, just one line of data. All right? So what do we have to do? Well, we have to put in the proper tags to tell that this is meant to be a table, that this is meant to be rows and columns. Now, there's four basic table tags. Then there's a few advanced tags, but we'll start with the four basic ones and we'll get through those today and maybe we'll do more advanced stuff or not. All right. The four basic table tags are this.
There's a table tag. The table tag goes around the whole table. All right, it says, this is a table. All right. There's a TR tag, which stands for table row. In other words, this is a row of the table. Tables are comprised of rows. Each row can be one of two, can contain one of two things. THs or TDs. So that's, the table tag is a table. I won't write it again. TR stands for table row. TH stands for table header. TD stands for table data. So in this example, I have one, two, three, four, five rows. The headers are this, and the rest are data. So this has five rows. Each row has four cells. In the first row, those cells are THs. For the rest of them, those cells are TDs. So let's go and actually create the table data for the table that I'm trying to create here. So I'm going to put in my table tag. I'm going to put in my TH, TR tag rather, to indicate row, because a table is a collection of rows. So inside a table tag is a bunch of TRs. Each of those TRs then can contain either THs or TDs. This is a header. In other words, this is an actual data. This simply tells you what the columns mean. The first column represents the city. The second column represents the temperature for January. The third column represents the te uh, temperature for February. And the fourth column represents the, the temperature for March. So this is what the first row of the table is going to look like. Now, just so I don't forget, I'm going to put the end table tag down here as well. My next table row. I got rid of that one. Now these are not headers, they're the actual data. In other words, Cleveland is the value of the city for this row. 15 is the value for January. 22 is the value for March or February. And 23 is the value for or 32 is a value for March. Now, I'm going to go in and copy this table row and change the data to make it work for Honolulu and Houston.
All right. So what do I have? I have a table tag. The table contains three rows. So a table contains rows. Each row contains cells. Those cells can either be THs or TDs. How do we know what belongs to what? We know based on position. So in other words, the third cell in each row is February's temperature. All right? So things have to line up. So in each one, the third cell is the temperature for February. So let's go and save this and view it. And now we're talking. Might not be a beautiful table, but at the very least, it looks you can see the rows and columns. Why? Because we tagged it to, to show the rows and columns. We put in the TR tags, we put in the TD tags, and so on. Now, what's the difference between a TR and a TH visually? I'm sorry, a TD and a TH visually? A TD is, by default, left aligned, and in plain text, a TH is center aligned and bold text. So you can notice that city is centered aligned. It might not be obvious, but January is also center aligned. It's just that that column January, that TH takes up 100% of it, so you can't really see that it's centered. But it's centered. All right? As is February, as is March. So this column is this big. The March column is this big, and March is centered within that area. So, notice this is without any styling whatsoever. How big did it make the table? In other words, how come the table takes up this much space? Well, yeah, the table by default, if you don't specify any sizes, the table will be as big as it needs to be to hold the data. All right? And that goes on a column by column basis. So in other words, how wide is each column? The column is as wide as the biggest entry, the biggest cell in that column. So how big is the city column? The city column is big enough to hold the biggest entry. And in this case, the biggest entry is the word Cleveland. All right? How big is the, uh, the second column? Big enough to hold the biggest entry, which is January. How big is the third column, big enough to hold the biggest entry, which is February. How big is the fourth column? Big enough to hold the biggest entry, which is the word March. So if I were to go in and put something goofy in here, like a message under 82 to say, in recent times, the temperature has been much higher. I don't know, put some additional note in there. If I do that then, then that February column becomes this big. Again, big enough to hold the biggest entry. So it's not necessarily as big as a header is, it's whatever the biggest entry is. Now that's if I don't put any kind of styling to it. Remember, as always, the way your web page looks is a combination of two things. The default behavior of HTML, which that's the default behavior of HTML, to make the table columns big enough to hold the biggest piece of data. All right. But we can always change that via CSS, and we can always, you know, make changes to 
the default behavior and have it look the way that I wanted to. Now, in this case, I'm only putting words in the table, right? Could I put other things in the table besides words? Why not? So, for example, I could have a picture of Cleveland. I could have a column that showed a picture of Cleveland, a column that showed a picture of Honolulu, a column that showed a picture of Houston. I could have a link to the city of Cleveland's official homepage, the city of Honolulu's official homepage, the city of Houston's official homepage, and so on. So any HTML content that I want to, I could put inside a TD or TH cell. All right, so I'm just doing text, but you could put images inside of it. You could put links, anything that you want to, anything that you need to put in there, you could put in into a TD cell. And again, the same rules that apply. You know, so if I had a column of images, then the column would be big enough to hold the biggest image. All right? Again, by default. So now let's go and let's take these basic table tags and apply some styling to them. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give a width to the table. Now I can give the width of the table two different ways, right? just like I can give a width to anything two different ways. What are the two different ways I can give the width to something? I can give a percentage, or I can give what? Pixels, right. So, which of them is generally the better thing to do? Percentage, again, because that allows you to develop pages that are responsive. So if you have a gigantic screen, it will take up a bigger area. If you have a small screen, it will take up a smaller area. But we'll do it both ways just to demonstrate. So I could go and I could say table. With. 500. Oh, let's make it, yeah, let's go 600 pixels. All right. It made those 600 pixels wide. All right. How did it decide how big to make each column? Is each column the same size? It might be a little hard to see, but each column is not the same size, right? If I look here, February is that big. M March is only this big. February is that big. How did it decide how big to make each column? Kind of the same as before. It makes them sized in proportion to their content. So whichever, whichever column has the most content, it's making the biggest. Whichever has the smallest amount of content, it makes it the smallest. Now what could I do to improve the way this looks? All right. What makes this table hard to read, if it is hard to read? Well. I don't like the fact that these numbers are over here and these labels are over here. All right. Does that mean that I put these guys in THs to match this? That's a trick question. No. All right. Remember, you never lie to your browser. This is not a heading, so it should not be in a TH tag. But I want it to look like a TH tag. Well. You put the styling in to get it to look the way that you want it to. So what I can do is I can say TD text align center. Is 
And so now it lines up a little bit better. What if I wanted to make every column the same width? First of all, let's do this. Let's give, let's give each TH a border. Uh, I'm sorry, let's give every TD a border. It's going to be a little box around it. So now it might be easier to see that February is bigger than March. How could I make each cell, I'm sorry, each column have the same width? I guess I'll make each cell have the same width too if each column is the same width. How would I do that? I could either set the TD width or the TH width to be, the set, to be a certain width. If I hard code a width in, or if I, hard code's the wrong word, if I style a width of it, then that width applies for every cell in that column. So if I say CD or TD width, 25%, since there's four columns, that should make everything equal in width. And sure enough, it sure does. All right. Now, what if I try to trick the browser? What if I'm feeling mean? All right. And I say I want each cell to be 55% width. Well, how could that be, right? I got four cells. 55% is going to be, what, 220% when I multiply the 55% by the four cells. Well, the browser takes a shot at it, <laughs> all right, is the bottom line. So you can give impossible instructions by CSS, right? If I, have four, if I have four columns in a table, I can't possibly make each one of the columns 55%. But the browser tries. And it tries by making as many as it can 55% or does as much as it can. And then it just guesses at the size of the others. So what's the, what's the, the message of this? The message of this is, obviously, you wouldn't do that unless you were trying to, to mess with the browser, right? But if you give instructions accidentally that the browser can't possibly handle, then the browser does its best to accommodate that, but it's not going to follow instructions if they're impossible. Likewise, if I were to say the total width of the table is 600 pixels, but the width of each cell is 100 pixels, well, there's 200 extra pixels to deal with. The browser's going to figure out what to do. And the browser will accommodate that by, actually, it went back and it made each one of them more than 100 pixels, right? Made each one of them 150 pixels, because that is more or less, because that is, um, one quarter of 600 pixels. Now we can get into percentages. So maybe instead of specifying a width of 600 pixels, I specify a width of 80% for the table. All right. So 80% means 80% of what? Well, 80% of the available space. In this case, that's 80% of the entire window. When I specify that the columns have each 
25%, that's 25% of the table space. Because remember, the TD is contained in the table. So 25% for the TD doesn't mean 25% of the entire screen. It means 25% of the table's width. And therefore, as I make it more narrow and more narrow, it resizes it. Now notice at a certain point it doesn't stop making it any smaller. And notice that even though I said each one should be 25%, March ends up being smaller than February and city in January. Why is that? Well again, I've given impossible instructions to the browser. The browser isn't going to cut off content. All right? So in other words, it cannot make that February cell any smaller. So it doesn't. And it takes the space off of March. At a certain point, it can't make any of the columns smaller. So it stops making them smaller. And even though I said the width is 80%, the width is actually bigger than 100% of the available space. All these things, all these features are good things, by the way, that it does it that way. That way you don't have to worry about like writing code that's going to like cut off content. What if I had, again, February generally has very unpredictable weather. If it needs to, it will put the content into two lines. But it's not going to break a word in half and it's not going to cut any content off. So as I, at this point, each column appears to be the same width. As I narrow it, at a certain point it can't make that column any smaller, so it makes the March column smaller. So these are all good things that it doesn't do that. Now, notice, let's go back to kind of the way we want it. Notice that there's a little space between each cell. All right? I can get rid of that gap by saying border collapse. I lied. <coughs> and I lied again. Google to the rescue. Got to put that on the table tag, not on the TV tag. Give me six or seven tries and I'll get anything right. There, there I go. So border collapse sort of smushes the borders together to make it look kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. Now, 
If I was a more experienced Wiley teacher, I would say that I make mistakes like this on purpose. All right? To demonstrate that it's very difficult to have everything memorized. But I remembered that there was a border collapse property. And I knew it had to do with tables and I could collapse the border and so on. You don't want to have to look up everything when you're developing an HTML page. But it's impossible to memorize everything as well. So it's okay to remember, gee, I thought there was something like a border collapse, and then do some Googling to find out the specifics of the syntax. All right, so that's not a sign that you don't know what you're talking about. That's a sign that there's so much in HTML and CSS that occasionally you gotta look things up. All right, and um, again, if you have to look every single tag up, then you're never going to be able to complete a web page in a timely way. All right, so yeah, there's some tags that you should know off the top of your head. But for certain situations, it's good to, or it's not, I won't say it's good, but it's acceptable to um, look things up. I'm going to get rid of the border here. Oh, now I spent all that time with the border, I'm getting rid of it. I'm getting rid of it because I want to do something else with it. This is going to be the puzzler for today. We'll end class with this and then we'll continue more on this next time. So right now I have this with no borders at all. What if I wanted to have a border underneath the headers? So I want an underline underneath the headers. So I want no border at all on the cells, but I want a line and only a line underneath that. What would I do? Yes? Do a pH and then go to the bottom. Okay. Let's see if he's right. One PX is what? The width. Blue is the color. Dotted is the style of the border. And that's a little hard to see, but those are one pixel little blue dots. Let's make them big, bigger. Remember, most of these properties, and then I'm, I'm going to make it, I just did that to demonstrate those properties. I'm going to make a one pixel black solid border. And so now we have the underline there. Remember, many of the properties associated with the box model, you can specify top, left, right, and bottom. All right? Um, also, many of these properties you can specify either individually or as a group. So I could have said border bottom width, one pixel, border bottom color, black, border bottom style, solid. Or I can combine them all into one border bottom. And that's generally the way I, I do it. Okay, next time we are going to play more with the styling of this table. All right. And then we're going to talk a little bit about accessibility. Because, remember, what does a screen reader do? A screen reader reads the screen going across. So by the time it reads 82, if you're just listening to it narrate the table to you, is 82... March for Houston? Is it February for Honolulu? Is it July for Cleveland? What is 82? We know that 82 is February for Honolulu because visually we can look up and across. But when the screen is being read to you, you don't have that luxury. Therefore, there has to be another way to 
understand that, yeah, that's what that means. That, that, that actually means that it's February for Honolulu. That's what 82 means. All right. Um, so that will be next week. We'll talk about those two things, additional styling. We'll talk about some additional table tags that you can use, sort of the advanced table tags, if you will. And uh, then we'll talk about table accessibility, and that will be on Tuesday. All right. We'll see. Any questions? We'll see you up in lab.